Hey guys, I'm June Delasala with Audioholics. And I wanted to give you a little personal insights to how I do my amplifier tests, particularly AV receivers. I'm actually sitting here, it's late at night, it's like 2 a.m. I just got a Marantz SR8012 wired up. I'm gonna be doing some power measurements on it. I've done all the preamp measurements on it, but I just wanted to show you my test fixture. Very informal video. I got a new camera here that I could stream with. I'm sure the quality is not the greatest, and I'm sure people will complain. But that said, I wanted to give you a little peek into the Audioholics testing realm. How's it going, Brian? I see you saying hello. And guys, when you, when I'm doing all this, uh, just comment as to where you're watching this from. Let me know what country or state. And let me know what AV receiver that you guys are running. I'm kind of curious. I'm actually going to be testing multiple receivers in the next couple of weeks. I'm testing this Marantz SR8012 first, and then I'm testing the new Integra Research DTR 4.2, which has um, HD base T capability. And I'm going to be talking about that probably tomorrow night. I'll do another live broadcast. So anyways, I wanted to show you my test fixture. It's not the prettiest test fixture. I'm going to warn you, my test loads are old. I've been using these test loads for like 15 or 20 years. They're 200 watt non-inductive resistors. I also have very large, powerful resistors that can handle two kilowatts. They're about two and a half feet long. I don't use them on receiver tests. I tend to use them on monoblock amplifiers, which I will be doing in a month or two when I test some new monoblocks. Cool, we have someone from Australia. We have someone from Austin, Texas. Nice. So I'm going to move the camera. It's going to get a little shaky. I'll try to do it as slowly as I can. Just want to kind of show you guys my test setup here. So what you're looking at now is you got, we got seven resistor loads. These are non-inductive 200 watt loads. I'm running 10 gauge cable to all of them, trying to keep the resistance down as low as possible. You can see I've got another resistor bank behind the receiver. That's the Marantz SR8012 that you're looking at. And I've already done the preamp measurements. I'm getting ready to do the power amp measurements on it. Hello from New Zealand. Thanks for coming into our channel. So I wanted to tell you about the test equipment that I have. Very few AV publications have this capability. You know, most of the time you'll see uh, companies testing only at one kilohertz and they just use an O-scope which I have, I have an O-scope. I have a Sencor analyzer on the bottom shelf here, an old uh, oscilloscope, analog oscilloscope. I rarely turn it on anymore because I've got a very sophisticated audio precision here. This is an HDMI audio analyzer. This is an eight channel. It'll do HDMI testing. It'll do balance, unbalance, toss link, you name it. This test equipment alone, just for this audio precision is about $40,000. So this is pretty pricey stuff here. And I've got it plugged into a Furman line conditioner, and it also has battery backup, so I don't lose power. It's regulated. And I test my amplifiers on a dedicated 20-amp line. And I'll just show you the rest of the equipment in the rack here. I've got a Yamaha integrated amplifier, the AS801, I use for my desktop reference system. And then above that, I have what's called a Wayne Kerr magnetic analyzer. And this is when I do all my cable measurements or impedance, measure, impedance measurements. Again, this is a very sophisticated piece of gear. You typically find this in very hardly hard-driven engineer-based companies. I'm fortunate enough to have this equipment so I could do more accurate testing for audioholics. And then you can see my messy desktop. And I've got my uh, RBH speakers. I got a Velodyne subwoofer on the ground. So I wanted to show you the um, the interface for the audio precision. Right now it's in demo mode because I don't want this thing turned on. It makes too much noise. But what you're looking at now is a base management measurement. I'm checking the high pass and low pass crossovers, the filters in this receiver to make sure the slopes are right, make sure the 3 dB and 6 dB points are right. And then I do other stuff. I do uh, power measurements, crosstalk, SNR. In fact, I probably wish I'd talk to you about this a little bit more while I could actually see myself to make sure that you're seeing me as well. Sorry for the camera shaking, guys. This is not a J.J. Abrams film. This is Audioholics. 
So anyways, I wanted to tell you, um, the first thing I do when I get a receiver like this Marantz SR8012 is I go in and I update the firmware on it. You always want to make sure you update the firmware on these receivers before you get them connected because you never know what they can change. They add features or they might fix, you know, a problem that they find. Always update the firmware. Uh, yes, Will, I am burning the midnight oil. I work my best at night. So you always catch me online around 2 o'clock in the morning doing this kind of stuff. But anyways, the first thing I do is I update the firmware. And once I got that going, I get into the on-screen display. I set everything up. Uh, I try to do everything full range initially because I want to check the preamp outputs. This Marantz in particular, it's an 11-channel amplifier built in, 11 channels of processing. So it'll do 7.1.4. But I always check, make sure everything's full range at first. I don't check any of the base management initially. I want to make sure that the preamp is good. And we test up to seven channels driven at the same time. It's really unrealistic to go and test anything more than seven channels. When you think about it, especially in a receiver, this receiver is rated at 140 watts a channel. So if you try to do 140 watts times 11, that's 1,540 watts. And then you divide it by the inefficiency of a class AB. And you're looking at 2,500 watts. You're not getting that from a 15 amp line. The power supply in this thing is not big enough for that anyways. So if you try to test for more than seven channels, even up to seven channels, you're testing more of the line sag than you are the power supply in the receiver, especially when the receivers have really big power supplies like this one. So anyways, what I do is I check the preamp outputs. I check frequency response. I check signal to noise ratio. I check channel to channel um, isolation or crosstalk. And I make sure all that stuff is good. And once I get a good feeling for that, I also look at an FFT distortion to make sure there's no nasty harmonics. I usually take a one kilohertz tone. If you get a good FFT at 1K, then usually the multi-tone test will do well as well. So I don't go crazy on all those different kinds of tests unless I'm doing like a really uber expensive product that warrants more detailed testing. I try to do the most basic test that'll give you an indication of how good the uh, performance is on these products. So after I do the analog preamp outputs, I check the HDMI. I make sure that there's no funny stuff going on with HDMI audio. And then that's when I get into the power amp testing, which I'm about to do now. You saw the resistor loads on the floor. I check, um, I check first, I check two channels driven full bandwidth. Then I check seven channels driven at one kilohertz. And I check it at, I show you the distortion at 0.1%, which is the onset of clipping. It's not really clipping. You can't see 0.1% clipping on an oscope, but you can see 10% clipping and 1% is, uh, you start seeing it as a square wave. So I check out the, all those levels and I report the power on those levels. Then I also check at four ohms. I never test a receiver at four ohms for more than two channels driven. It's just not going to handle that. Um, you're going to put too much power tax on the power supply to get heat up too much. I think it's realistic to limit your, your power testing on receivers at four ohms to two channels. And that's what I do. And then I also check the dynamic burst tests. I use what's called the CEA 2006, which simulates dynamic music program material. So it'll show you the headroom of the power supply. I usually like to see uh, one channel driven and then all channels driven. And then I could kind of gauge, you know, real world how this receiver will perform when you're driving multiple channels with program material, because we don't test with sine waves. We don't have we don't listen to continuous test tones. We listen to very peaky music, and that's why I use those kind of test tones. So I'm going to look at the comments here and see if anybody has any questions. Someone's asking me what a good center channel is for under 250. There's a lot of good center channels for under 250. I think you should check out some of the online brands, you know, SVS, um, RBH Sound has a new line of impression speakers. There's so many brands out there, guys. Um, we, we cover this stuff. We've got Dayton Audio, really inexpensive Dayton Audio speakers that we reviewed that are much less than 250 Check out our reviews on Audio Hawks. You can find out all of our recommendations there. Someone says they use Yamaha for movie surround sound. They have an Avantage RXA2000. That's a good receiver. Uh, let's see what else we have here. Someone's using a Denon 4300H receiver. That's cool. Yeah, now this, this receiver is kind of similar to the Denon 6400H, except the Marantz has some significant upgrades in the audio sections. I'm going to be talking more about that when I do my formal review. I don't want to let the cat out of the bag right now. And then someone here is saying they have an SR7012. 
Uh, they just took it to the service center it was as it was playing up. Sorry to hear that. And that's about it, guys. So I hope um, seeing my test rig kind of gives you an indication of what I'm doing here. And, you know, it takes time to set this stuff up properly. I repeat my test results twice to make sure, and sometimes three times, to make sure my results are accurate. And before I publish any of my results, I always send them to the manufacturer so they can confirm it. In fact, I found an, what I thought was an issue with this Marantz receiver initially, and it went all the way to Japan. It went all the way to the guys at Japan that designed this receiver. They took my test file from Audio, Audio Precision and simulated it on their end, and it turned out that I had a problem with my settings in my test file. So I'm always glad that I peer review. That's one thing you always do as an engineer is you get peer review. It's not like a journalist that doesn't like to do fact checks with third parties. I'm not like that. I like peer review. I like to make sure my stuff is accurate and everybody makes mistakes, but I try to minimize them as best as I can. So I hope you guys understand that. And someone else just said they have an AVR 7200. Wow, that's a nice one. You guys have a lot of Denon stuff here. Another one with a 3400H. Uh, Martin Logan's Motion 4 speakers. And someone's saying, thank you for the work, Gene, taking the time to help consumers. I appreciate that. I really love doing this stuff. Um, I'm planning to do more live broadcasts like this. Tomorrow night, we're going to unbox an Integra Research receiver. I know you guys like to see that stuff unboxing, so I'm going to try to do that for every time we get a new equipment in here. And then probably in about two weeks, I'm going to start showing you all the Control 4 stuff that we're going to be looking at because we're going to do a, an entire home automation project. We're going to revamp Audioholics and have every system in this house under home automation with the guys with the help from Control 4. So there's a lot of stuff coming, guys. I'm going to try to get this stuff on YouTube as much as possible. And that's about it. I think I'm going to get to um, testing this receiver. Now, I wanted to tell you before I start doing the power test, I don't just start doing it right away. I actually precondition these amplifiers. I run them usually at a couple of watts per channel for about 10, 15 minutes. Make sure that the idle currents are all set. You don't want to just start blasting a receiver at full power when you're doing your test. You want to make sure the thing is properly biased and warmed up. So I do that and I check the line voltage when I'm measuring it to make sure I'm not measuring line sag. Because a lot of times if you're running these receivers at full power and, and the voltage goes from 120 down to 115, then you're not going to get as much power to the receiver. I always make sure that I have you know, enough adequate power going to my receiver to make sure I'm not testing line sag. So I hope I'm not giving you too much info. I tend to, to babble on a little bit. I think I'm done here, guys. And until next time, keep listening.